learn to talk with the hand. everybody welcome back to Maspi Marziali tonight we have with us we will talk about Jeet Kune Do and we have with us Sifu Singh Harinder hello hello Claudio how are you good to see you I'm fine thank you how are you I'm, I'm fantastic man another great day just finished training and come hang out with you right now it's it's morning for you right Yes, yes, it's about 10, 15 in the morning here in California. Okay, so it's not a problem for you. You drink coffee <laughs> and I always, I drink my beer, okay? Perfect, it. I love it. We start. I love it. Okay, so I have many, many questions. I think it, it will be... Or five hours podcast. I'm joking. <laughs> I wanted to see what. Okay. So uh, first of all, um, you you dedicated yourself to Jeet Kune Do. Your martial art training and teaching. Your life is is about Jeet Kune Do, right? Yes. Yes. That that is the. Can the you main tell thing. us? Can you tell us something about your experience? How did you start, and why did you start with Jeet Kune Do, or you chose Jeet Kune Do? Well, two things. When I was very young, so my the first art I started in was karate. And uh, my my sensei gave us two books when I was young, 13 years old. He said, you have to read Goren no Sho, the Book of Five Rings by Musashi and Tao of Jeet Kune Do. So that's the first time I, you know, I'd heard about it in that setting. But if I rewind even more, my father was a sea captain. So when I was born, he used to travel. I was born in India, but he used to travel. He was a sea captain and he went to Hong Kong. And he came back from Hong Kong with a Bruce Lee poster. And I was a young child. And he put the Bruce Lee poster and a Muhammad Ali poster over my crib. So, so imagine like this, Claudio. The, you know how you normally a picture is like this, right? He hangs it like this. So I'm sitting in the crib looking at it. So it's, it's above the crib. So that was the first, I think, introduction. And then watching the movies as a child. I remember my mom tells me stories of running around saying Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, stuff like that. But really, um, it was later when I was in university, I was in a very bad altercation. I was in the wrong place in the wrong time. Um, and a gang was there. And basically, I almost lost my life in that, in that fight. I was along, they, they got my roommate. And um, basically, what happened was we're going to celebrate at the beach, a bonfire, big party, having some beers. We're the last car to get there. And out of the darkness comes a local gang. They were looking for someone. And the person they were looking for looked like my roommate. And um, they grabbed my roommate. All chaos broke loose. I didn't do anything heroic. Almost died. But that day, everything changed for me because two things happened. Number one, uh, I realized that my training that I had been doing up until that point, I've been in street fights and things like that before, but not something like that, like an organized chaos where they're organized in their battle formation and some people grab, some people shield and they're working together as a unit and they don't really care about you. That level of, of violence I had never really experienced in, in that way. 
So there was that thing. And then the next thing also at that same time, I, I experienced something very special. It was, you, you know, when time stops, you feel time yeah. stop and space stops and you're in the flow state. So in that chaos, they're running around. It looks more like a rugby match. It doesn't look like a, like everybody circles you. They come fight one and one. It doesn't look like in the movies, as, as you know. They're running. We're running around cars. They're chasing me. But in that moment, boom, time stopped. So time stopped. And I was in this place where everything was moving slowly. And for the first time, I felt so much peace inside that chaos that I was, it was the most magical moment I'd ever experienced. And I didn't do anything heroic, but that moment that I experienced, that, that's what my whole training was after afterwards. So long story short, what ended up happening, the guys they were looking for came. And when the guys that they were looking for came, they went and shifted our attention and we, God saved us. So we, 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 we uh, got away from that situation. But in that situation, I left it very angry. I left it uh, like, you know, you feel like less than a man. I was, I was afraid in the sense of like, oh, my God, what, what could I do? But anger was the biggest thing. I was so angry. And I said, you know, I want to become as dangerous as I can be. Because next time this happens, you know, you're angry, you're upset. You tell yourself, I'm going to kill everybody. And that you're just, you know, you've been traumatized. So there was that experience for me. And at the same time, I'd experienced this peace inside of it that I'd never experienced before. I never experienced that level of stillness in the chaos, that level of peace, that level of one with the Tao, that, that flow state that everybody talks about. And in the flow state, what happens is the, the you know, the talking in the mind stops. Time slows down. It becomes completely effortless and it's a beautiful experience. So I started to chase those two things. And in that, to become as dangerous as possible, I went down the Jikundo route. And then to understand flow and mind that, that stillness, I went into Tai Chi. But initially when I went into Tai Chi, because I was, I was studying to be an engineer, Claudio, at that time. So I, I was, it was one year away from graduating. So the next year when I got Canada, Canada, in California, I was in California. Okay. And so I studied to be a computer electrical engineer. I graduated. I got a great job. I got a great job, lots of money. I could pay privately to train with anybody I wanted. So all my training after that was private with the teachers, the masters, everybody I trained with. But, you know, I had this idea, right? I said, I was so angry. Now, it's funny that we could talk about it because I've healed from it. But the funny thing was I had this idea, Claudio, you know, Remember when we were younger, you read about the death touch, you read about, oh, dim mock, the pressure points. Yeah. So I'm like, man, I'm going to learn that. I mean, if you know, because I'm angry, you know, how angry you have to be that I want to learn how to kill people by touching them, right? So I said to myself, how am I going to do this? Because anybody who really knows it is not going to teach me, right? So I get a great idea. I said, okay, let me go, go to get all the books. I get the books, I start reading, and I'm like, huh, all these books and everything points to acupuncture points. This is Chinese medicine. I said, hmm, well, the only way to really know if it works for real is if I go to healing and go Qigong, medical Qigong, I start learning the healing, and then I reverse engineer the healing for the, for the, 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 the nefarious purposes or for, for killing. And so when I went in there, I said, okay, I got this idea. I'm going to outsmart the teacher. I'm going to learn the healing, and then I'll learn the other side of it myself. I'll figure it out. But lo and behold... The teacher knew and understood. And, you know, like most people who come to martial arts, we're angry. We're upset. There's fear. There's some something inside that you're dealing with. And through the training, I started to heal myself. And I started to realize, wow, that those people who attacked me were a great gift. Because before they attacked me, all I thought about was, it was the early 2000s, stock options, sports cars, lots of money, right? That's, that was the only thing. And after that, my perspective shifted to, okay, what, what is my life going to really be about? What is the quality of my life going to be about? What, what is the purpose? You know, you start asking those questions of why are you here, that there has to be more than that. And if, though, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have discovered this path. I wouldn't have discovered truly understanding who I really was myself, right? Because most of us, we wear a mask. We have this mask in front of us, this, this idea of who we are, we show to the world. But we're afraid of showing who we really are. And so that's how my path started. I went two ways like that and uh, in the Jikundo. But the interesting thing is if you look at the Jikundo symbol itself, 
is a Taiji symbol in the center of the Jikudo symbol. So the Taiji philosophy, I mean, why would he create a symbol with the Taiji? And it has to be more than just yin, yang, the balance. There's much more. Yep. It's a deeper philosophy. So I went those two routes. And then what ended up happening, they came like this and merged together and helped me uh, become who I am today. And uh, how did you start Jikundo? Uh, did you have some, you, you said just private teaching? I went, I went straight to, I, I looked around everywhere and I went straight to the person who I found looked the most dangerous and that was Paul Vunak. And I went and went straight to him and started training with him. Um, and then I, you know, I became one of his senior students and then used to help run the organization and teach for him and seminars and things of that nature. But I was there every weekend. I was every weekend I would fly to train with him, 36, 40 weekends a year. And then I even moved so that I was training with him every single day um, in, in, in the Jeet Kune Do. I also had a chance to train briefly with the Sifu Larry Hartzell. I've attended seminars with Guru Dan and Asanto. Um, and then I had some t uh, chances to spend privately to train with Sifu Richard Bastillo also in, in Jeet Kune Do. Um, the first time I met Jeet Kune Do, I mean in person, the first time I tried Jeet Kune Do was with the Richard Bustillo. Oh, great. The Iron it Dragon. Was also in, I, I went in Rome with a friend, hmm. and it was also my first time in uh, Filipino martial arts. I, I didn't care any, anything about Filipino martial arts until uh, they gave us the sticks. And for the first time, I, I smelled the sticks yeah. when they <laughs> burned each other. I fell in love with that. But I went there for uh, Mr. Bustillo because it, it was uh, the, my first chance to meet someone who trained under uh, Sijo Bruce Lee. Jeet Kune Do is an open art. We can, we can put together, uh, put everything inside Jeet Kune Do. Do you think Jeet Kune Do can be so open that we can put everything inside, uh, everything we train or we, are, we experience and it's still Jeet Kune Do for you or for you Jeet Kune Do is something that it's like Bruce Lee created? Okay. So first, first is that it has to be about principles and processes. So we take away what we want to add to it. So if you're just adding things to it to add to it and call it Jeet Kune Do, and there's no strategy, there's no, it's not following principles and processes. The principles and processes that are in Jeet Kune Do, if you look at it, are in all great martial arts. They're all in all great martial artists at the end of the day. So can you add whatever you want to it? If it works for you and you understand the principle and you understand how to make it work because everybody's different. Now, what yep. Bruce Lee, if you look at Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee is changing and evolving. So what you see is before he died is a change in evolution and growth, constant change, constant change, evolution, constant growth. But the key that he's always looking for is the answer. He's, he's looking for the answer. So the purpose is to look for the answer not be given the answer because you could, I could give you the answer or, you know, I've, our teachers could give us the answer, but they rob us of the experience of finding the answer. It's yeah. in finding that answer that I find myself because it's their, it's their experience, not, not ours. A hundred percent. So if you just do what Bruce Lee says and you're building your experience off his experience, it's not going to be real. It's not your experience. So you can say the words, you can say the techniques, you can repeat it. But you get a foundation. Through him, you can see how to think. Through him, you can see how to research. Through him, you can see how to test and to experiment. You can see that. But now you have to apply it to you. And the other thing you have to apply it to is what era are we living in now? We are living, we're not living in the 60s and the early 70s before he passed away, which was predominantly karate era, boxing yeah. era, wrestling era. This is not the era we're living in. We're living in a different era. So just like you look at a calculator in the 60s and 70s, it's not a calculator now. So we have to see, how am I going to apply it? I think the thing is, the question becomes, well, how am I going to apply this? And do I trust that it works? Or am I just believing what people told me? That's where the problem ends up being. It's like, you just believe it. It's like, well, this is how Bruce Lee did it. And this is how we're going to do it. That's a little difficult. But if you say, but if you go the other way too far and you say, oh, I'll just add everything to it that I want and just keep doing different things, 
That's also difficult because I'll give you an example of, on that side of things. So let's say you do a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. Then you do a Wing Chun class. Then you do a Muay Thai class. Then you do a Kali class. And, and, and so you're doing all, studying all these different arts, but you're studying them separately. But the goal is that how Blending. does it come like this? Right. So are you studying the blend? So if you look at, you know, even even in Wing Chun Gong Fu, one of the big misunderstandings of Wing Chun, if you look at the, the translation of Wing Chun means elegant spring. It means elegant spring and spring is what spring is the transition between winter and summer. So it's a transition. So it really means elegant transition. So if you look at winter and summer as maybe striking and grappling arts, then it's an elegant transition. Because it has no real entries. Do you see what I'm saying? It has not a, not a real entry system. It's a sticking system that once you're already inside to give you transition. Yep. So if we look at it, how do you make that work? How do you make Jeet Kune Do work? How do you make any art work? You have to look at, okay, let's look at the, 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 there's an entry phase. Then there's, once you're in, then there's finish. So it doesn't matter what art it is. It's always going to be like that. But once you're in, that's when counters happen. That's when sensitivity happens. So if this is all your training is once you're in, then it's hard for you to get in and out. If you're all your training is the finish moves, then you don't know how to get in and counter. So I, I, I yeah. think I think that I think that what ends up happening, my friend, is that martial arts is such a wonderful thing that that it, but it needs to be an experiment for you. You have to be like a scientist. You can't just believe what people tell you. That's very difficult, and I think that's where you. But then you lose the art too, right? It's kind of like, hey, I, we go, you and I, we go to a painting class, and in the painting class, the teacher is painting a certain picture, maybe the Mona Lisa, and we all, all we do is we paint the Mona Lisa. We don't, and we learn to paint by painting the Mona Lisa. So we say, okay, these are the different brush strokes, there's textures. Oh, okay. But once we learn that, do we want? Don't we want to paint something else? Don't we want to have another art that we want to create? And, and so I think, I think at the end of the day, it really comes to the development of the individual, the person. And, and we always have this conversation, what style is better, even within Jeet Kune Do, is it concepts, is it original? I think that's the wrong question. I think that what it should be is that why don't we come together and talk about what are cool things you do, what are good things I do, or, or both sides do, and how do we train together, and how do we discover new things? How do we but apply new besides, things? Besides the fact that there is the concept and the original and the, the problems between two different branches, there is also functional and, and many, many others. But if we see someone moving, we can see and say, mm, I see, I see, this is Jikundo. There is something, there is something different. The footwork, the timing, the broken rhythm, maybe. There is something that you, you can say, yeah, I think that that guy is playing or training Jeet Kune Do. 100%. And movement never lies. So we'll do a simple combo. Watch me first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two. Now that's the second one, see, because I'm wound. This is already here. One, two. Okay. Now they hit this, this pulls. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see? So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You see how everything is thrown as one unit? Timing never lies, right? Controlling space and distance never lies. But then you can even see that, okay, you go look at a good boxer. If you can see them doing it, you can say, well, he's doing Jeet Kune Do. You can see yeah. maybe, maybe a good MMA fighter. Like, he's doing Jeet Kune Do. If you, yeah. like you said, if you have the lens to see the body structure, the alignment, the, the, the timing, the footwork, the broken rhythm, the leading, the fainting, fainting the following, the adapting, the shifting, all those different things. Um, Make it beautiful, but that's what makes a beautiful martial artist. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not just in Jeet Kune Do. Do you do you have some MMA fighter that you always see and and say it can be Jeet Kune Do? Okay, few few guys. 
you can see the latest, uh, you see Israel Adesanya do things like that. You see Anderson Silva, okay? Lyoto Machida, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Demetrius Johnson, um, yeah. George St. Pierre, um, John, John Jones, Jones, John Jones, yeah, John Jones. So I think you can see aspects of it anywhere, but really, yeah. right? It's the principle. It's the principle. It's like hop, there's a fake, hop, boom, bang, you set up. Oh, drop the guard, you set a rhythm, drop your hand, draw it in, boom, it's like oh, attack by draw. Okay, so you can see it. I mean, it's, it's just universal fighting, right? Like it's, you get, a good fighter will come to the same realizations. There's nothing secret. Uh, you like, you really like trapping. I also like trapping. And uh, I saw your trapping videos, really, really nice. Uh, why do you think there is not much trapping in the MMA? I think that, um, okay, so back to when we were saying, that in MMA, they're focusing on, if you look at their focus, on, they're focusing on striking. So punching and kicking, longer range. Then they're focusing yeah. on, on clinching. Then they're focusing on the, gro the ground. So both from a takedown defense perspective and then on the ground working to do ground and pound if you're on the top or on the bottom submissions and getting up. So they have this framework, right, that they're, they're building. And they're working to transition uh, through that framework. First, get each individual skill good and then put the skills together. So it's a time thing of how much time that they're spending in doing that. So I think once they have that, this is the next thing that they could add to it because you do see trapping happen. If you look at Kumaru Someone. Usman, yeah, you look at Kumaru Usman knocking out Jorge Mazda. He faked, he faked, and then he trapped and then went up high for a hook. But instead of going to his head, he went to his hand and pulled his hand down and punched him and knocked him out. And so you, you, you do see it. You see it in high-level boxing. You see Lomachenko do it all the time. You see, boxers use it, uh, but I think... Also, I, I, in Mashinko, I also see something about Panantukan. Yes. In, in the feet, in the footwork, usually in, in the way he grabs down the, the, the punch and gives the, the hook. Yes. But naturally, with gloves, everything changes. With rules, everything changes. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And I think the other thing, too, is that it, there's... There, it's an introduction thing also, I think, that why it's not there is that they haven't seen it. I've worked with a lot of some MMA fighters, and I teach them how to insert trapping. But I think you have to know how to box really well already, and you have to understand wrestling in that context, in that game, to be able to then insert it in the middle. It's very difficult to try to trap somebody in the game of MMA yeah. in the rule set if you first don't have what's before the trap, the boxing, and what's after the trap, the clinch. So those, you get solid in that, and then it's a very easy thing to add because you're just using it for a moment to transition, right? And, and, and I think it's the next thing. I, I believe that it'll be the next evolution in MMA. Uh, regarding evolution, do you think if Bruce Lee was still alive, he would be around, around the cage to watch on Saturday night MMA? 100%. 100 percent how, how can you not i mean you know how, how can you not appreciate those athletes that go in there and they yeah. do that, right how can yeah, you not like, yeah. like 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 he was watching boxing we you know back then you'd watch if you'd go watch boxing or you go watch kickboxing or karate tournaments how can you not he, appreciate a great athlete if he was if he was alive do you think that uh, jikondo which direction would evolve i think it would evolve in the way that it has currently um because it would go towards understanding. See, one of the things happens is that when you look at the, okay, so you look at MMA, just for example, there's, there's boxing, pure boxing in it. Then there's kickboxing, which is slightly different, right? There's some people in MMA who are really good boxers and they're really good kickers, but they're not good kickboxers. So they don't look like kickboxers. They're boxers who learn kicks. Then there's people who are like more Muay Thai and they have that kickboxing base. So you have different kickboxing bases. Some guys are really good, just boxers. Like I'm not even going to throw a kick and I'll become a good wrestler. So they're building these styles, right? That are variations. And I think that if you, you have to understand the clinch, every, it's where you end up. You have to understand takedown defense. You have to understand how to get back up from the ground. If you're not a grappler, for example, you have to learn to under, how to transition so you're not afraid to be taken down. So I think the thing is that what we would have seen is 
an understanding of these other arts and how to learn enough of them and understand them so that we could create defenses against them or actually defense is the wrong word. So we could create the right block to fit in with it from a counter perspective, an interception perspective, and so on. So I, I think that that's because you need the other art to make you grow. You need yeah. that other person to give you. The, otherwise, if, we're, if, if I'm in my Jeet Kune Do and I'm in my school and I'm training with my Kung Fu brothers or whatever, it's the same energy. It, it's, it's, but am I going to fight another guy like you? No, I was like, okay, I need to feel a boxer. I need to feel a wrestler. I need to feel a jujitsu. I need to feel this type of MMA, that type of MMA. I need to feel Kung Fu fighters. That's the fun of it is like, how can I take what I do and how do I make it fit with this? But I can't make it fit with this if I don't have an understanding framework of what that is. Um, and, and I think that's important. So if, if that open-mindedness to learn and absorb and grow is, is there, I think that's the key thing. And, and the route it would take would be one of finding out the truth in combat against the people that you would be facing, what you see that's out there, right? I think that's the key thing. Today we have YouTube, but we have everything. We can watch uh, Kondo or mm, generally martial arts in every way possible. Uh, let's pretend we are in a period there is no YouTube, there is no... We just have movies, okay? We just have VHS. Yeah. Uh, someone comes to you and asks you, uh, what is this Kondo? How can you explain telling this guy, you can see in that movie, there is a scene, there is a fight. That's for me, it's Jekondo. Is there something like that for you? Yes, yeah, so you go to Chuck Norris and uh, Bruce Lee in The Way of the Dragon. That's, that's if there was a scene, there's there. And then you go to Game of Death and you see it in the, when he's fighting all the different people all the way up to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You see it there. Um, Really, those are the best scenes of it. Enter the Dragon is more, there, there's there's some, in Enter the Dragon, you have more Jeet Kune Do philosophy that he talks about. Yeah. But you don't really see as much Jeet Kune Do in Enter the Dragon as a duel, you know, uh, against other martial artists. So the best places to see it is first, you watch, the best one is to watch Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, and then watch Game of Death in the end when he's going up. I think those are the, the best examples where you can see broken rhythm, you can see timing, you can see interception, you can see trapping, you can see kickboxing, you can see takedowns, mm -hmm. you can see uh, submissions, you can see all of it. But most importantly, what you see in it, if you look at it, is how he's adapting to the opponent. Because he's always telling a story that this is my opponent and this is my strategy. Oh, it didn't work, yeah. now I change. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I was thinking also about the Long Street episode. That's right. That that's minute, that minute, it's. That's a very good for me, one. Yes. That's a good explanation. Also, he just moves a cup, a kick, a side kick, maybe, and just something. But the things he says is perfect to explain what is Jikondo. And uh, also, I I really like also the the fighting with Bob Wall. Uh, mm -hmm. in the way of the dragon before <laughs> chuck norris also yeah. in the open space outdoor that yeah. one also i really like a lot the intercepting with the kick i would like to talk about what you teach um how do you start a guy who has a little experience in martial arts comes to you and wants to train jikundo how do you start footwork basic uh, basic punches boxing mm. I, the first thing I start them with is the breath. I teach them about the breath and I teach them about being present and I teach them about tension and how tension rises in the body, tension rises in the mind and to understand how we have to control that with the breath. So the first lesson is always about the breath and then I take them into footwork so they can work the breath but in a knife. So I give them do make people do knife fencing and knife tag i don't like to say knife sparring it's knife tag you play tag so then you're moving try to hit the hand try to hit the leg and you're moving get them alive and moving and in that movement they realize right away 
how quickly they can lose sight, sight of their breath present moment and the opponent and get fixated on the knife and get tension in the body and that's the very first lesson is that they realize that under pressure if we do not control the ability to relax under pressure we're going to get tense so the is first some kind of ecological approach pardon As someone say that ecological approach you don't teach a b c but you start with the taking confidence yes It's the first thing okay. I, I want you to be, I want you to understand that the biggest weapon you have is the ability to relax under pressure. Because if you can't relax, the art doesn't matter. If you can't breathe and slow down when pressure is coming at you, it doesn't matter, right? So we, I want them to be present and aware of their breathing and of time and space at all times. And then from there, we do the strategy and the tactics and learn the lessons. And that's how I teach it. And then you proceed then to punches, kicking. So I start them with the knife. I make them work with the knife in the beginning. So one side feeding and the other side hitting the hands. So they're learning to move, to angle, footwork, go to zero pressure, watch the opponent. Then I use them, teach them to use the knife against multiple opponents, feeding numerata style, one side feeds. So they're getting used to moving and breathing and watching. And I want them also to get used to being aware of their energy, their stamina. Like, am I getting tired? Am I not getting tired? Do I need to slow down? Do I need to speed up? So I have this principle called B war. So it's breathe, B. E is manage your energy. W is watch and follow the opponent. A is then adapt. And R is choose a response. So then the lesson could be, okay, Now the tactic, the response is defang the snake, hit the hand. But I don't want you to hit the hand till you're breathing, managing your energy, till you're watching, moving and adapting the, to the opponent. And then boom, there is now we hit the hand. You can hit the hand when it comes to you. You can hit the hand when it's going away. You can split the force. You can hit the timing. Then I teach them about the timing. You can hit before. You can hit during. You can hit after. Then I change the pressure of the feeder. So then the feeder can start to hit with a lot of power. Then I change that to quick, quick speed, changes in speed. Then I make them go into faking. Then the feeder can be faking, changing speed, coming with power. And you, all you're doing is breathing, watching, adapting, moving, and cutting the hand. So in that very first lesson, I teach them about timing, about spatial awareness. But most importantly, the biggest thing to me is the state of the operator, the state of the, the individual taking part in the activity and you always managing it. You, you normally what happens is we start thinking about a punch, a kick, a technique, and we make the technique first in our mind. I don't want the technique first in the mind. I want your state in first in your mind, the breathing and the watching first in the mind, following the opponent first in the mind. And then from that operating system, you choose what it's going to be. So always the front operating system has to be breathing, watching, adapting, following, and joining your opponent. So leading with awareness, leading with awareness of yourself, awareness of your opponent, awareness of time and space, and never lose that. And from there, we start to add the different uh, techniques. Here you go. So when you're at home, you can take up a little bit of the stress inoculation, come over here. Okay, in my hand, I just have a little bit of taser. All right, so you go, I get a move. Here you go. You fake one way, come back the other way. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Now, here, here. And I'll breathe. I want to coach him to breathe. One of the most important things you got to understand in fighting, right, is this. <gasps> When that moment gets there, you have to coach them out of the tension. So I got to bring him down by slowing down my feet. Breathe. Just watch. You're okay. No big deal. No big deal. Today's a good day to die. We're going to die one day. Go, go, go. Here you go. Oh, no. Good job. Good. I just want you to see that you can train and train safely, but the most important thing is, are you managing your breathing? Are you connecting to your partner? And are you communicating with your partner? I need to communicate with him. If I see him get stiff, I gotta go, hey, breathe, relax, calm down. 
The mastery in a fight or in life is your ability to identify tension and bring yourself down. Does that make sense? Because you're going to get tense. Shit's going to hit you. But how quickly can you come back to zero is the most important thing. Okay. And uh, what about footwork? Do you mix the typical Jeet Kune Do footwork uh, with boxing and also Filipino martial arts? Yes. And then from there, as they start to understand that framework, um, then I start to teach them the footwork. So footwork is next because footwork controls the distance, footwork controls the timing. And so then we teach them simple things of uh, step and slide, uh, push shuffle, pendulum, triangles, main male and female, box steps, circling like Muhammad Ali. If you look at the footwork, can there's footwork to go straight in, there's footwork to go around, and there's footwork to go back. Really, that's it. If you look at all styles, they fall into that. It's styles that yep. go straight in, styles that go around, or styles that go back, draw you back. So if, once you understand principles, then you can understand easier how to apply the different things. And so I, I want them to have an experience. And then the experience is the most important. Oh, experience a principle so they can understand it. And then from there, we add the technique or the technical mechanics. Uh you, you give a lot of seminars. How do you prepare for a seminar? Do you change the program for every seminar? It depends on the people and the experience the, of the people. If you know you're going to a place where they already train Jikondo or you already know them. So do you change? How do you do that? How do you prepare for that? So the first thing with the seminar is what is the audience? So my seminars range from military law enforcement, martial artists, uh, executives, um, and to personal development talks. So there's different seminars that I teach uh, to Taiji and Qigong. So, you know, who is my audience? The most important thing is I go, and one thing that I'll give advice to anybody teaching a seminar is that the seminar is not about you, it's about them. It's about my, the students attending. It's not about what I want to teach them, it's about what they need to learn, where they are at. And the seminar changes. There may be a topic, but how I teach the seminar is based on how well they're picking it up, um, what they need, and I'm teaching them for what they need. And so one of the important things that when, when I teach a seminar is I'm constantly following and joining the crowd to see how are they picking it up. Is this helping them? Are they getting stuck on this? In which direction to go from there? And I, I interact with the crowd. I'll have a general topic, and in that general topic, I teach to them the way they need to be taught. Mm -hmm. So I have a plan, then I have a plan to change. The first question is from, uh, from my friend Richard Kilik. He's a Serac player, and um, he asks you, what is Jikondo? Well, the, def the definition of Jeet Kune Do is the way of the intercepting fist, yeah? But let's really talk about that. What is it? It's a concept. It's an idea, right? Can you always intercept somebody? No, you can't, right? So I think really what about Jeet Kune Do, if we really go deeper, is that it's the way of knowing yourself and knowing your enemy. It's the way of being able to change and transform to what is needed, it's, the, it's the about understanding who you are, what your limits are. It's about understanding your opponent. It's about understanding fear. It's about understanding your doubts. It's about really looking inside and asking yourself, how do I free myself from myself? The limiting thoughts of my mind. How can I be in a fight and just be free? Free of thought free of wanting to do something, free of being attached to victory or defeat. How can I find that freedom? And that freedom is normally always tied to things we've learned growing up, through traumas we've learned. Like from every single person we know has been betrayed, rejected, and abandoned. So we all have what? A need to protect ourselves. So the first thing is you have to let go of your need to protect yourself so you can be free. Because even the need to protect yourself is coming from fear. Can you let it go? Okay, okay. Uh, another, another question is from Enrico Pietra. 
if I have to translate his name, ciao Enrico, it would be Harry Stone. Okay, Enrico Pietra, it's, uh, um, he wants to, to ask you, do you believe trapping is still so important? Because many people talk about trapping, it's, not, it's useless, it's difficult to apply, it's really, really hard, uh, it will never work and stuff like that. I think it's very important. I think that once you touch somebody, you can feel their base, you can feel their root, you can feel their balance, you can feel their weight. And from that, you can feel when they're going to move. Now, that being said, uh, and many arts, Wing Chun, Tai Chi, Jeet Kune Do, uh, Silat, Filipino martial arts, so many arts have it, but the key then becomes, how do you make it work? So trapping is beyond just trapping the hands. You're trapping their center of balance, their center of gravity. You're setting a trap. So when you think of trapping, think of setting a trap. The part of making trapping work is how well are you setting the trap? How well do you make them expose themselves so you can trap them? And many times you trap the person's ego. You trap their mind. You trap their spirit. So you can trap all. Trapping is very good, but it comes down to when people say trapping doesn't work, the question should be, how do I make it work? Why does it not work? And how, what have I done to try to make it work? It's very easy to say it doesn't work because it's just like any skill. It's difficult. You have to spend time, but you have to research. You can't just believe what somebody tells you. So there's drills you have to do. There's um, sensitivity you have to build. But then you have to have your experience of testing it and playing with it to make it work against different people. The most important thing that you need for trapping and for Jeet Kune Do or any martial art is you need to have an empty mind. You have to be able to feel. Because feeling, when you're touching somebody, you're feeling them. You're feeling their base. You're feeling their balance. You're feeling their root. You're feeling their emotions. You're feeling. But you have to be able to feel first. So you have to be able to heal. You have to heal from all of your own shit. Before you can feel inside you, then you can feel inside other people. Now, that being said, if you don't know how to fight, you can do all the feeling in the world and you're still going to be in trouble. So you have to yeah. have both aspects, right? You got to put yourself under pressure. You got to get, you got to get smashed. So you go with a pro boxer and you box with them. You, what's going to happen? You're going to get smashed. You go to the jiu-jitsu with a world champion, what's going to happen? You're going to get smashed. You have to be okay being smashed. You yeah. have to be gone. You got to be like, okay, cool. I can relax. I lasted a little longer today. You must learn the, the art of losing. The art of losing. That's it, my friend. You have to be okay. So when you're okay, you're like, okay, no problem. That attitude, that relaxation, you know, what is relaxation? But relaxation under pressure is the skill. And can you change? Because if somebody asks me, what's my favorite technique, right? I'm sure you get that all the time. It's like, what's your favorite technique? What's your favorite move? I'm like, I don't have one. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have one? You have to have one. I'm like, well, all techniques can be countered. All moves can be countered. All styles and systems can be countered. So there cannot be a favorite. So the only thing there can be is change. And that. Uh... You in the beginning of this podcast, you also said that you train Wing Chun. Yes, sir. Did you train Wing Chun because of Jeet Kune Do or because of you really liked Wing Chun, or it can give you something more for your uh, Jeet Kune Do to understand the, the center line? Both, both. I just really liked it. I also knew, you know, about the mother art and how it would help me in Jeet Kune Do, and I wanted to investigate the roots of Wing Chun to understand Bruce Lee better and his thought process. I also just loved the art. I love the cheese out on the track. I just enjoyed it. Um, but my teacher actually at that time, Paul Bunak said something interesting to me. He said, if you can go, he said, I'll teach you the kickboxing, the Jeet Kune Do, the boxing, the Kali and the Jiu Jitsu, the Jeet Kune Do and, and, and the individual arts in it and that. He said, but if you can go and really learn the traditional art of Wing Chun, And you can go and learn the traditional art of Taiji, 
the tradition, the real tradition, and go through the full steps and understand it all, not just throw it away because somebody said throw it away. You will come back with a much better understanding of tradition and reality and sport and really understand how it all works together. And so that's what I did. And it really helped me give a better understanding of Jeet Kune Do, of pressure, of flow, of structure, of alignment. Those are such important things. That same center line alignment is there if I'm boxing. It's also there if I'm doing jiu-jitsu. The ability to feel base and pressure is there. How do I organize my body and my breath? How do I re learn relaxation when force is being applied to me? Those are great usable skills. It's very easy to say Bruce Lee threw it out. Bruce Lee says don't do traditional arts. So you say you don't do traditional arts. First of all, you're not Bruce Lee. Second of all, he went through it already. You didn't. So you're not going through the journey. It's the journey. I'm after the journey. I want the journey. I don't want to walk in somebody else's footsteps because that's not what Bruce Lee would have wanted anyways. He said it's the art of expressing yourself, of honestly expressing yourself of who you are, not honestly expressing myself through thinking what Bruce Lee would do. And so I'm going to do what Bruce Lee does and be a copy and a clone of Bruce Lee. That's not what he wanted. That's not what you can do is. That's not what any good teacher wants in any art. No, the art absorb the art reject. And um, another, another from Salvatore Manzella. Uh, Salvatore was a he. He started Jikundo with many teachers, and also the last teacher he had was uh, Tommy Caruters. Okay. He wanted to ask you if there is some other uh, uh, teachers that you really like. Their their Jikundo. Oh, I think that you admire also other people, also other teachers. I th I think that there's, I think every teacher out there in Jeet Kune Do is great. I think every single person has something very unique that they bring to the art, something very unique that they've discovered. Right? You mentioned Tommy Carruthers; he has something very unique he's discovered. Ted Wong had something very unique about him. Richard Bastille, Larry Hartzell, Burton Richardson, Lamar Davis. They all have, of course, Guru Dan and Asanto. They, uh, Eric Paulson, Rick Young. Do you see what I'm saying? There's so many people uh, that have discovered wonderful things. And those are the people, more popular names, right? But the thing is, those are maybe yeah, first and different. second. Yes. All different. All different. Second generation names. But there's now, let's think about the third and the fourth generation. You see, one of the problem, one of the things is there's a limiting belief that there's the founder of the art. And then after the founder of the art, there's the one or two, three, four, five disciples. And then you look up to them like gods. And then you don't think that you could ever achieve that because there's the master, the founder of the art. Then there's the, the four or five disciples that are the leaders of the art. Then, oh, then there's this generation under. And then afterwards, you're like, none of us will reach those levels. This is the, this is the mindset that has to be removed. You could be as good as you are, but it's your thinking that makes you slow. It's your thinking that stops you from growing. I think the key is look at all of them. Like you said, they're all different. Not a single one of them moves the same way. Yeah, so, totally so instead different. of saying who's better, which is just silly, why not be like, oh, I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. And ask yourself, what are you going to do? Who are you going to be? How are you going to solve the puzzle? And I think that's the real power. That's where the real power comes. And, and so I think I, 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 it's my hats off to everybody before and everybody who's going to come after me for Jeet Kune Do, for every martial art, because you love it. You're putting your best and doing your best to it. Who is anybody else to judge? And, and judgment, you know, we say, you know, cursing, like you, you curse somebody, you know, like, uh, you know, that word curse. Like a like a you 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 like a cast a spell on them or something. Yeah. So the original cursing is criticizing people, complaining about people, condemning people. That's the original, and that's all people do: criticize, complain, and condemn. Instead of being like, "Hey, let's bless them, let's praise them, let's honor them," and be like, "Oh, that was really good. How'd you do that? Show me how you did this." Because that's the real. If we do that, I mean, man, nothing can stop you as an organization, as a group, as a martial art. But the problem is that it's those limiting factors that get in the way. It's like, my teacher did it right. Okay, your teacher did that right, great. Doesn't, and, and, but then, but my teacher has to be right, so I'm right. 
and you're wrong. But those are all functions of the ego. You just haven't worked through the real war, which is inside here and in your heart. You, there's an ego and there's an attachment. And there's a need to show people that you're better. So what's going to happen in a fight? That ego is going to kill you. Totally agree. Uh, Matt Drago. I don't know if it's the real name. Drago is Dragon. It's surname. Maybe it's a nickname or something. Hmm. From Matt. Uh, he would like to ask you in which way you personally use the five ways of attack. And also, he would like to ask you about BTAA. Broken timing, uh, angulated attack. Okay. So five ways of attack. First of all, the five ways of attack need to be used in combination. So don't think of just a single and attack by combination and trapping and um, attack by draw uh, as separate ways. They're just five different ideas, but you need to combine them in different combinations. So maybe you do a single, you move, you see, you do, do, do a double and then you do a trap. Maybe you come forward and you drop your hand, guard, he comes, boom, and you come in and you trap. So you have to learn to use the five ways of attack as combinations and string together techniques and combinations that have those elements of those ways of attack inside of it. The next thing is once you've learned the five ways of attack, you have to let go of the five ways of attack. You have to have no way and, the, and whatever is needed comes out. So it's just a stepping stone. For BTAA, broken, uh, broken Rhythm Timing Angulated Attack, very important. The key to that is that you have to set a rhythm. You set a rhythm with your opponent, long and short rhythms, to start to read their patterned responses. Once you read their patterned responses, you store that information. Then you go do some other stuff. And later, you come back and you change and break the rhythm on that. You don't set a rhythm and break it right after. You set a rhythm to find what the relationship is between you and your opponent and how they're going to react. So you have the prediction of it. And then from there, you start to uh, use it in a future pass. And something I'll say about interception. Interception is not just when the opponent comes to me and goes first, right? So opponent, most people think interception is, oh, my opponent attacks, but I intercepted him. So that means they initiated and then you intercepted them. Okay. Also because it's a confusion between the HIA, the hand immobilization attack, and the attack by drawing is some kind that can be brothers. 100%. Uh, and and, and there, there should a good HIA will be following a good PIA, a good fake and a good feint. So they're all together. The whole thing is all five have to be like this, like your fist. Not you study them to understand, but they need to be operated on like this, not like, oh, I'm just going to trap. Because if you have that in your mind, that that's what you're going to do, you're going to be slow. If you're thinking, you're in the past. If you allow yourself to not know, you're in the present. From the present, you can listen to the future. And so when you look at interception, interception can't just be you go and then I intercept you. No, there's interception offensively also where I go first. How does that work? Interception works that once I throw something to you, once if I throw a jab to you, I know that you have two options. So if, if I do something, because I've done something, my opponent has one or two options in the next moment. So I have now narrowed down the possible options that he has to two options. And because I know that, I can then intercept his next option. So I can go boom and I can intercept your counter. So interception can be offensive and interception can be uh, when the other person goes, which are, both are offensive. But I think that the skill, the biggest, most important skill to understand here is that when you take a look at um, Chinese Gong Fu, interception was one of the eight fists. Okay. It's just one of the eight. The first most important is following. You have to build the skill of following your opponent 
mirroring your opponent, joining with your opponent, seeing what they see. There cannot be me versus you. If it's me fighting you, I'm doing me, they're doing them. You have to get rid of you and it has to be all about them looking at you. So I have to be able to look, be inside you looking at me. What is important to you? I have to let go of all of me. I have to join you so we're one. So if we're one, your movement is my movement. But that is the training that we want to get to and not leave it just in the physical realm of, I'm just going to intercept you faster. Oh, I saw your shoulder move, so I intercepted you. Well, the person could trick you that way too. Yep. So the, the how do you get how do you release yourself from time and space and how do you release yourself from your mind and how do you join your opponent? How do you follow and join your opponent? How do you do that skill? Then after that, whatever needs to happen happens on its own and you're just watching it. And that's where we want to get to. Because then if you lose that way, hey, it's a good day to lose. Because that guy's better than you. <laughs> uh, last question from my friend, Lino Budo. Ciao, Lino. Um, he would like to know uh, what do you think about the teaching, uh, fighting teaching and the um, safety operators of law and enforcement? If the principles of Jeet Kune Do are still important for law enforcement, Hermes? Uh, 100%. Uh, when you're looking at law enforcement or you're looking at army, military, special operations, right? They're different groups. Law enforcement has many more constrictions. They have many more rules they have to follow. You have a military operation is different rule set, right? Less rules, uh, different situations, different conditions that they're going to be in. So, of course, the tactics and the strategies will slightly differ, but the principles have to remain the same. The principles of watching your opponent. The first most important thing is can you relax under pressure? Can you slow your heart rate down? When a punch is coming at you, are you afraid of being hit? If you're afraid of being hit and you're afraid of being humiliated, and this is an honest question for anybody to ask. If you're afraid yep. of being hit or afraid of being humiliated, that's the first thing you got to work on. Now, you know, the interesting thing is many people are not afraid of being hit, but a lot of people are afraid of being humiliated. So that fear brings in tension. So it's about understanding fear. It's about understanding reactions. First in yourself under pressure. Then seeing those reactions in other people. So, okay, so once we understand that, good. Then you have to understand the principles. So, for example, uh, interception. Very important. Understanding timing before, during, and after. Very important in the execution of any technique. Then understanding space and management of space using footwork. How you go to zero pressure. Very important. Using, of course, I'm going to say defang the snake from Filipino martial arts. One of the most important things. They have a baton or you take a knife, you just hit the hand. You, they need to learn. The thing with them is they have to learn something very simple that they will retain and never forget. Because the training also differs depending on the agency, the country, the department, right? It's very, it's such a vast thing. So people think in their mind that law enforcement is training every day all the day. No. Sometimes they only get eight hours of training a year, if they get that. Others maybe get more. Now military, they're training all the time. Okay, so there's going to be different. But now when military is training, you have to remember... Empty hands and knife and edge weapons is a very small portion of what they're training compared to gun and shooting and the extractions and drive. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes people think, oh, a military system is more advanced. Well, they have things that are great, but understand that their empty hand is very small compared. They're going to shoot you first. So they're compared to their gun and other things is very small portion of what they're going to do. So it comes down to the amount of time they spend training. Um, it comes down to the application of the force. It comes down to the situations that they're in. But more importantly, the principles are true in all of them. So the principles of intercepting, the principles of watching, the principles of breathing, the principles of broken rhythm, the principles of timing. That's the same if you're trying to handcuff somebody or trying to hit somebody's hand or trying to stop a punch. They're the same. And what you have to do with them is you have to teach them common shapes that can handle many situations. 
So you can't have mm. one move for this, one move for that, one move for that. It's like, okay, if I go like this, this can deal with the with a straight punch. And this can, if I just turn my body, this can deal with the hook punch. So I have to give them one thing to deal with uh, X number of tools. So like transfer technology, right? And so it, it, be, it comes down to a time constraint for them, how you teach them. Um, it comes down to their ability to retain the information. But the biggest thing that they always walk away with and the reason I've had great success with them is because I always talk about mindset first and making yourself calm so you can make good choices. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to the choices you make under pressure. And are those choices coming from anger? Are they coming from fear? Are they coming from tension? Are they coming from panic? Or is the choice coming from, huh, this is crazy. Okay, I'm going to make this choice. Do you see, is it coming from a calm place? Is it coming from a, a place of no emotions? Can you be a ghost when you make those choices? Because that's what's good. They're, they're trained already. You know what I'm saying? They're, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, also, I, I was thinking about that, about their, their mindset. They're still there because they train all, all, every day for that. So, or maybe, so maybe it, it would be easier for you to teach that or it's almost impossible to teach someone for just data works one, one year. It, it, you know, that, that comes with the agency. So at least yeah. something is better. How do you than arrange that? that? How do you do that? So you just the, have eight, year, eight, eight hours. Yes. In one so year. I, I have a course that I give them in eight hours, which is the most essential eight skills. Yeah. Eight skills. And those eight skills have to cover 95% of the situations they're going to be in. Like here's these eight skills and each skill has to build on each other. So it's still together. It's not just some random thing. So that's that's how it that's how I designed the program for them, and um, so far it works pretty good. Okay, um, Singh, are you right or left? I mean, it's not politically. I mean, uh, do you <laughs> your stance is uh, right or left? Uh, naturally, I'm right-handed. Right-handed, and you are right in uh, your right stance. Do you follow do you follow that rule in Jeet Kune Do? I I have my right side is better than my left side but I don't have a preference. It's, my side is going to be whatever side I need it to be when it needs to be what it needs to do be. Do you think do you think it depends on Filipino martial arts that it's it's 100% switching all, all the time? Oh 100%. I mean I I've, I've spent just as much time doing Jeet Kune Do as I've done Filipino martial arts. It's there's always together. For me it was never separate. So stick, double stick, going left, going right. And then every drill that you do on the right, I did double on the left. Just because if you look at, if, if my right is stronger, right? And I do prefer to be in the right. Well, then if I start off left, I'll give you a whole false sense of an idea of what kind of a fighter I am. And then I can change right in the middle instead of just starting this way. And uh, did you also train some Penchak Silat? You know, that's the one art I didn't train too much of. I, I didn't get a chance. Maybe a little bit in the, a couple seminars I attended. But I, that's one art I never had the, the time to really go deep into. Okay. I, I wanted to ask you this because I, for me, it's really, really hard to switch between heel up, heel down. Yeah. It's, so I wanted to know something about if you have the same problem with some other martial arts that you, you have to keep your heel down. Yeah, and so when you I, do the Jikundo, you are heel up and do the pitching all the time. So in Taiji, in Taiji Chuan, the heel is down, yeah. right? So, so much like Penjat. I, the one thing I notice is that the, there's a lot of similarities in the practical applications of the two, the two arts. So I went with Taiji. And in Taiji, there's many times you have that. But here's the interesting thing. The, the foot is a pump, right? So the, the foot, if this is the foot, it's a pump. It has to pump like this. So the weight has to go from the heel to the ball of the foot. So even if the foot is on the ground, I'm still transferring the weight to the ball of the foot or transferring the weight to the heel. So actually it made my heel up, heel down situation even better um, because both helped me ground and create the structure from the knee, the connection of the knee towards the ankle. Uh, going the knee going more towards the heel gives a better stability than my knee going into my hip 
that whole line becomes better and much more stronger. And then when it's stronger, it can be more compressed, like a like a like a like a ball, boom, and come out from a compression. So both arts have helped me a lot. But I think, as you know, even in Silat, the relaxation and structural alignment is so important that once you learn it, then you can put it into any structure, whether it's the sticks or the knife, heel up, heel down. After a while, I mean, it doesn't matter. But yes, in the beginning, in the beginning, definitely, it's all oh, heel up all the time. Now the heel's down. Uh, there, you had to, there was a learning curve, yes. Okay. Last question. Uh, how old are you? I am 46 years old. Uh, 46, okay. Uh, how much is important the physical training, the conditioning and muscle, muscle training and weightlifting and stuff like that? Yo, it's very I want I ask you your age because I wanted also to ask you now you are 40, can you repeat? 46. 46. Okay. Let's pretend you are 60. Do you think yeah. your jikondo will change in 60, 65? And so your your training must be must must do something different maybe in the future. So sure. I wanted to ask you how is important your physical training and how can be changed when your age get older? So um, the physical training is very, I think it's the most important thing. The physical, mental, and spiritual training, all three have to be trained every single day. So from a physical training perspective, at 46, I'm stronger and faster now than I've ever been in my life. And I have teachers that I've seen that I can continue to grow and get better with time because the other issue is our relationship with time. How you're training is very important because, first of all, most people just train to train or people train to lose weight or whatever the reason is. For me, strength is a skill. Like martial arts, strength is skill. And I want to understand the skill of strength. So that the body alignment, the fascia alignment, the usage of the tensions, the usage of the breath. And with an external weight, I use kettlebells a lot. I've been training kettlebells for over 20 years. Um, I do kettlebells. I do the Indian body weight system. I use the, the mace or the gara as well. And a lot of the taiji chuan, we reeling, silking, and coiling, in the reeling and silk, uh, coiling of the silk. A lot of meditation, most of my time is spent medita in meditation and becoming softer and connecting the tissue. And overall, what I find is that as I age and get more time, I have a better, more efficient usage of the body. It's able to do more and different things. So I'm actually excited to get older. And one of the things that I'm excited about is that I train today so that when I'm 80 and 90, I will be in great shape. I'm not training today for today. I'm building a foundation that I want to live a life in which my body, which is my temple, is a vehicle that I do martial arts or live this life with. Yeah. It's strong. It's powerful. And the, it's, it's, it's mathematics. Everything is mathematics. It's just numbers. So numbers, okay, where is and what are the progressions of increasing in strength when you hit a plateau? How do you get over it? And it's just, my friend, it's just mathematics to me. And so it's every day going at it. But it's going at it every, like before we came, I was telling you, I was still, I was hoping to stop sweating before I got on the call with you. And the thing is, because it feels so good, because you feel alive. But with that, you have to balance that with complete stillness. Can I just drop? into this void of nothing then when i open my eyes can i keep it and i also spend time in prayer and meditation i want to connect to something greater than myself because at the end of the day you know it's the last question but as martial artists we are here to serve people we are here to protect people we are here to make this place a better place for people so we cannot be doing our will. We have to do the will of something greater than us. Whatever your belief system is, whatever your higher power is, your higher calling is, the whole point of this is to work through my own fears and all my own shit so I can get to the point to connect to something higher and do a higher will. Otherwise, what is the point? Am I just going to keep fighting because I'm still angry? 
Am I going to keep doing martial arts because I'm still filled with fear? Is that why I'm going to keep doing it? I'm going to try to keep getting faster? All that stuff goes away. The only thing that we're left with is the influence we had on people and show them our transformation. That going from maybe an angry person, a fighter to a healer to a leader to somebody who provides a safe space for people to be who they are. And I think that's what we do. You know, we have this thing uh, called the Warrior's uh, Creed. And Robert L. Humphrey, after World War II, he wrote it. And he said, everywhere I go, anyone in need has a friend. Wherever I am, everyone is a little bit safer. But when I come home, they're happy to see me because it's a good life. So, I mean, at the end of the day, he's saying, wherever I go, everyone is a little bit safer. It's like, okay, that means, hey, I'm here. Not for me, but for you. Safer doesn't just mean physically. Safer means, hey, you know what? I allow you to be you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to put that on you. you know? And anyone in need has a friend. Is any You see somebody who needs something, you're there to help, serve. But when I come home, my family's happy to see me because I work on myself and my own issues so that I can be present and be there for them. And I mean, this is the real warrior's path that every tradition has talked about. Every art really has talked about. How do you go from a warrior to a healer to a scholar to then they say priest or mystic, but the point being connection to something greater than yourself. So you can serve something greater than yourself. Because otherwise, what would be the point? Uh, it was the last question, but I, I think I lied. This is the last. Okay. <laughs> because I remember another thing. Uh, what's the situation of Jeet Kune Do in the world right now? And what do you hope for Jeet Kune Do in the future? Well, I hope that this is a beautiful, wonderful art. We have a great legacy. It's brand new art. If you look at like the timeline, it's very new. Not like some of the other arts that have been around for hundreds, some for thousands of years. I think there's a great opportunity in Jeet Kune Do for all the different teachers and everybody to come together and just do what you do, man. We're still teaching the same principles. We still come from the same source. And the, at the end of the day, it's not about what I teach or what you teach. It's about the benefit your student is getting. That your student is getting more confident. That the student is getting more courage. That the student is getting a more clear mind. That the student is becoming a better person. I believe martial arts is the greatest vehicle to develop human potential. That's yeah. what we're doing as teachers. Agreed. So if we can do that, that's our all of our mission together. So for Jeet Kune Do community, I mean, hey, that's what Bruce Lee was about. So we could argue about details, put your fist here, this and that. But that's a waste of time. Nobody's going to remember that. What people will remember is that regardless of differences, if people can come together, train together, and just not put each other down, it would move much better. It would move in a way that... We're still here to help people, man. That's it at the end of the day. It's not about me. It never was. It's not about you. It's not about the other people. It's not about the teachers. It's about your students. It's about how well they grow. It's about how what a good time that they're having. And not everybody needs to be a fighter. That's it. It's okay. But they need to they need to have some people come for a hobby. Some people come for a community. Some people come because they want to be good fighters. Hey, there's room for everybody. Perfect. Okay. Um, if there is someone that wants to know something more about Singh Hardinger, you can find all the info below this video, this podcast. There will be the, the links and everything that Sifu Singh will give us. So, Singh, it was a pleasure uh, to talk with you. I really thank you for accepting my invitation. I hope in the future I can invite you once more. I and I also, uh, do you have some schedule in in Europe or somewhere new in the in the in, in the near future? It's some seminars, workshops. I am I am actually going to be trying to schedule something for 2024 for Europe. So either in uh, Italy or uh, in England. Where? In, Where? Um, so I have a student in Italy in Rome, uh, in Marco oh, Simone. Okay. 
So maybe we're still still sorting it out. Maybe Spain. I have another student in Spain, so I haven't figured it out yet. But I would like love to come to to Europe uh, next year and and see all my friends over there. But I, it was a real honor to sit down with you. I've watched your videos. I love your stuff, man, and it's really cool Thank you. to get Thank to you. know it's, you. It's an honor to hear something like that from you. No, it's an it. honor. Hopefully, we can train together someday. I hope. I hope. Let me know when you come to Rome. I it's will. Rome is just two hours from my house from my house. So okay. We can okay. do that. We can okay. do that. Awesome, man. Okay. Awesome. Thank Jane, you. Thanks again. Thanks again. Thanks. thanks again. It was a pleasure. Pleasure was mine. Goodbye. See you soon.